everyone. Um, my name is Lois Kaneem, and I'd like to welcome all you all to our symposium, which is on whether our silver pasture is a sustainable option to help tackle deforestation. And so just first off to introduce the speakers from today. So I'll be presenting. I'm from the University of Reading in the UK. We'll then have a talk from Christina rosikas Lucas from the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology in the UK. And then Ignacia Sepulveda will talk from Scotland's Rural College. And finally, we'll have Maria Paula Escobar um, from the University of Bristol. Um, and just also to encourage and remind you to use the question and answer, the Q&A function, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and to post any questions you have throughout the session. Um, Christina and I will um, go through them at the end. And um, please don't use the Whova platform to post any questions during the live session. If we run out of time or if you think of questions after the session, you can always go back to Whova later and post your questions or directly message any of the speakers today. Um, so yeah, um, enjoy your talks and I'll chat to you afterwards in the question and answers. Hello, I'm Lois Kaneem. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom, where I work with Dr. Mike Garris. And today I'm going to be presenting some research we carried out in collaboration with Luis Miguel Hernandez from SEAT in Colombia and Jordani Ramos Pastrana from the Universidad de la Amazonia in Florencia in Colombia too. And I'm going to be talking about invertebrates as indicators of the conservation value across different habitat types on farms which have adopted silvopasture. So just first off to mention the larger project that I'm a part of. So I'm part of the Biosmart project, which is an interdisciplinary group. Um, we're looking at the impacts of silver pasture farming on um, social um, aspects, environmental and biodiversity. Um, we have a number of speakers presenting today, so you, sh you should learn a lot more about the project. Um, but just if you want to know any more information, we are on Twitter and we do have a project website if you want to take a look. Um, but first off, just to introduce you to silver pasture, if you're not familiar with it, it's a form of farming that's ancient and it um, is, combines trees and shrubs with pasture or grazing land. And it's thought to have a whole suite of benefits associated with it. Um, so socially, it's thought to improve the livelihoods of farmers through the diversification of income streams if farmers were, are able to plant crop trees within the pastures. Um, it also has environmental benefits, so it's seen as a sustainable form of intensification where you can increase your stocking density of your cattle um, per unit area, um, reducing the need to convert further land. Um, it's also been associated with the recovery of degraded areas and improved soil quality. It's um, thought to improve carbon sequestration in farmlands, and there's a reduced need for inputs such as irrigation and um, chemical ones um, like fertilizers and pesticides. But their impacts on biodiversity are relatively understudied compar uh, comparatively. Um, so we carried out this research in Colombia. Colombia is the second most biodiverse country on the planet behind Brazil, but it's the most densely biodiverse. So there's more species found in Colombia per unit area than anywhere else on the planet. It's also home to 10% of the Amazon rainforest, and we worked in the Amazon region in the department of Kakata, which can be seen in the dark blue to the south, south of the country. And Kakata is experiencing the highest rates of deforestation. And of particular concern is small scale deforestation in the state, um, which can account for up to 80% of the deforestation. And this is associated with smallholder farming. Um, so we wanted to sample the invertebrates across farmlands and use these as indicators of the biodiversity value. And to do this, we used two forms of sampling. First off, we used, uh, performed sweep transects. So we, these were 50 meters long and we replicated them. So we had three in pasture, three in silver pasture, three on the transition zone between forest and pasture land, and then one in the interior of forest remnant, uh, remnant forest patches on all of our um, 16 farms in 2020 um, and then on five farms in 2018 and then we also set malaise traps so these can be seen in the lower panel it's an intercept trap so invertebrates are intercepted or blocked by the netting and their instinct is to move upwards where they're collected in um, a vial of ethanol and we leave those traps in place for seven days and we set one in pasture silver pasture and forest 
interior on five farms in 2018 and another further farm, uh, five farms in 2020. Um, so just to show you what the uh, habitat types look like on the farms, our farms are really heterogeneous. So the left hand um, panel shows a traditional pasture. Um, you can see it's very, uh, there's not many trees or shrubs in this um, type of pasture compared to the second or middle plot that shows a typical silver pasture plot. So here you can see the um, trees are planted in rows along the um, grazing area, around the grazing area, and they're protected by electric fences. And also these have been improved by um, seeding with Brachiaria species, so it's an improved um, fodder, fodder grass in this habitat type. And then the third and final pot shows a kind of typical view within one of these forest um, patches. So this is really um, secondary forest that are surrounded by um, electric fences to preserve them on each of the farms. And just to give you an idea of some of the things I caught. Um, so in 2018, Mike Garrett um, collected specimens representing 14 orders through sweep sampling. And then in 2020, um, we collected specimens from 19 orders. Um, some were quite rare, others were really um, common. And yeah, this is just showing you all of the kind of types of inverts we found before I convert them to numbers and show you the results. Um, there were some orders that were only found in sweep samples. So these were the mites and ticks that I carry, the harvestmen, dragonflies, mantids, pseudoscorpions, and the neuroptera. Um, and then the malaise traps, so we found fewer orders in uh, malaise traps. So in 2018, we found representatives of 15 orders. And in 2020, we found specimens from 12 orders. And again, there were some unique um, orders represented in malaise traps. So these were the Dermoptera and the Phasmids. Um, so once I collected all of the specimens, um, we sent them to Giordani and his team at the Universidad de la Amazonia in Florencia and Cacata. And here they sorted the specimens to order level, but we did get some higher taxonomic resolution on some key groups. So all of the spiders from her malaise traps in 2018 and all of her traps, the sweeps and the malaise have been um, sorted, uh, identified to morpha species, um, along with the flies. And they're currently working on the hymenoptera and the hemiptera groups for the 2020 specimens as well, which is great. Um, so just to go through some results, our first main question was whether invertebrate communities differed according to sampling method. Um, and to test this, I used permutational ANOVA modeling. Um, so the panel to the right will show you an ordination plot and each dot represents the community of invertebrates found in a particular trap or transect. Um, and then we, I, using the modeling, we were able to see that they are significantly different between the two sampling methods. So it's really important to use two method, uh, multiple methods when um, trying to gain information on invertebrate communities. And my second main question was whether or not the invertebrate community composition differed between habitat types. So these, for this, I use um, the package Enviabund um, and the Mani GLM function um, to test whether um, habitat type um, affected the community composition from 2018 and 2020 data separately. Um, so the 2018 data was based on just under 7,000 individuals from three transects and three habitat types across five farms. And then the 2020 data were like 13 and a half individuals from three transects and three habitat types, and then further forest transect across 16 farms. And then I included a number of offsets in the models to account for different um, sampling efforts. So in 2018, there was a variable number of sampling rounds, so I included that as an offset. And for the 2020 data, I used number of transects to account for the fact that we only have one 50 meter transect in forest patches compared to three in the other habitat types. And I used farm identity as a blocking factor to account for variation on each individual farm when testing these. And the results um, were really um, um, good, <laughs> sorry. Um, so first off, the left-hand side shows the 2018 results. So you'll see the ordination, the kind of blue, um, area represents the pastures, the green, the forest, and the yellow, the silver pasture. And I've detected a significant difference in community composition between pasture and forest. 
And then silver pastor did not differ significantly from either of them. So silver pastor is kind of acting um, as a, a, is intermediary to the other two um, communities and hosts um, individuals from both um, communities. And then looking at the 2020, we see that um, I included municipality as we had two landscape units for these farms because we had 16 farms. And we found that there were significant differences between the two landscape units. So that's why I've plotted them separately here. And again, um, all of the habitat types came out as significant. So this kind of indicates that there is um, unique invertebrate commun uh, communities in each habitat type across all of our farms. So forest, um, the transition zone between forest and pastures, pastures and silver pastures all host unique um, communities of invertebrates. Um, so looking at the malaise um, samples now, this was based on just under 3,000 individuals for 2018 and a further 3,655 individuals for 2020. And these were three traps um, in three different habitat types uh, across five farms in both years. Um, I use the many GLM function again um, and pairwise post hoc testing to um, look for differences between habitat types but there was no need for offsets because there was um, even sampling effort across all sites. Um, so the results of this didn't detect any significant variation in um, between community invertebrate communities collected by and um, through malaise tropping um, and but the you'll see in the ordination plots that it's kind of following a similar trend so the biggest difference we've detected were between forest and pasture which we expect but then silver pasture is somewhere in between, but it's not a significantly um, variable from either. Um, so the take home messages of this research were really that multiple sampling methods are important, especially if you want to look at um, heterogeneous environments such as these farms that we did sample on. Um, and also that silver pasture may host forest species on farmlands, which is important. Um, but also can form unique invertebrate assemblages. So we saw that with the 2020 data as well. Um, and just to um, thank all of these wonderful people, Shardania's team who continue to work under incredibly challenging conditions to get my data, it's, it's incredible. I'm very grateful. Marcella, Miguel er and Erwan from CF and the farmers and the landowners for letting us sample on their farms. And then my fellow uh, Biosmarties. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cristina Rosiques Plugas, and I'm going to be talking about the effects of implementation of silvopastoral systems on native plant diversity in pasture and forest habitats. My research is part of a larger interdisciplinary project named Biosmart which includes cultural geography, behavioral economics, and ecology. The objective of the project is to gather evidence that supports the implementation of silopastoral systems to improve farmers' livelihood and to um, conserve forests and biodiversity. The positive effects of silopastoral systems well are well documented, as the, such as the increase of land use efficiency or water use efficiency or carbon storage. However, the effects of silvopastoral systems on biodiversity are less studied. So by smart, we studied cattle ranching in the south of Colombia, in the department of Caquetá, which is part of the Amazon basin. These are, this is the area where we visited some farms, and as you can see, this is the primary forest, and this area has, is very deforested, and it has been since at least the 1950s. These are the 15 farms we visited, which, as part of uh, the project Sustainable Amazonian Landscapes, they had um, installed a silvopastoral system in each of these farms in 2016. And I'm going to show data we collected in these farms from 2020, so four years after the silvopastoral systems were established. This here you can see the example of one of these farms. You can see it has a small patch of forest, a uh, small um, remnant of secondary forest, and most of the area for its traditional pasture, which is um, extensive um, grazing, grazing land. And this project, they installed um, several paddocks of silo pasture, which included electric fences 
with rows of trees and a high yield uh, forage grass, brachiaria in this case. And as part of this, as part of the cell pastoral system included an area for conservation, which was um, either preserving an area of the remnant forest to not cut it down, or also allow an area of this forest to grow by natural regeneration. Here we can see one of the actual farms we visited. Here we can see the paddocks um, in the rotation system of silvestral system. Here is the forest, and this is the area they regenerated the past years. And we wanted to ask, what are the effects of silvestral system to plant diversity? And for that, in 2020, for all 15 farms, we did three transects of traditional pasture, three of silk pasture, and one of the forest. And the entomologists of Biosmart, they also they collected their own data on the same locations. Here you can see some pictures. These are the trees of the silo pasture. And here are the grasses, the forage grasses, and the traditional pastures, which some had trees as well. The traditional pastures and silo pastures methodology, we did um, 50 meter transects with five one by one quadrants in each of them, where we collected the species, um, individuals, cover, and other vegetation cover information. And for the forest, we did as well one, um, one 50 meter transect and we did point center portrait. And we collected uh, from five points, the closest eight uh, trees in each point. So we had 40 uh, trees per transect, for which we collected the diameter of the stem, the species, and the distance to the point of our transect. And uh, we couldn't go to in 2020, we couldn't go back to Colombia to study more of the forest. Um, but we were lucky that the local institution had visited this forest and collected information and we were able to work together. So we start with some results. Um, for the pastures, the silk pastures, each silk pasture had one dominant brachiaria species cultivar. While the natural, the traditional pastures, they had a few um, Spe um, grasses, and none of which was a dominant. We found overall in the pastures 93 taxa, of which nine of these were cultivars of uh, brachiale. So we found 62 native species in the traditional pasture and 72 in the silk sil pastures, so excluding this brachiale, the planted brachiales. And But there was no significant difference in species richness between traditional pasture and silk pasture. Of the 43 species that weren't shared between the traditional pasture and the silver pasture, 30 of these were singletons, so they only appeared once in one, in one farm. And two thirds of these rare species were in the silver pastures. We found significantly more bare soil in the silver pastures and significantly higher vegetation in the silver pastures than in the traditional pastures. I did a non-metric multidimensional scaling um, plot to visualize how each quadrat um, community, so we are plotting each species that appeared in each plot, and it, when we plot it, it separates as two separate groups, the silver pasture and the traditional pasture. And the same when we had abundance as well, the abundance we collect. But I was wondering, is this just because the silver pasture has the brachiaria? and not the native grasses and the same the other way for the traditional pasture. So I excluded the, um, all the grasses in the, in the plot and then it, they, are, they are less separated, but it still splits them in two groups. The results for the forest, we found 343 taxa, 80% of which uh, to species level. And with the, um, we, we estimated the density in each transect, which is each farm, and there was a quite a big difference between farms. But then if we look at the basal area that's calculated to the diameter, so more basal area, there's more, more timber, you know, there's more biomass of, of forest. We see that some tree, some forests that were not very dense, they had really big trees. And, and the other way. there's this one that's very little density and very small trees which it was an outlier because it was the only farm from the 15th visited. But in 2016, 
um, when the Sylvesters were installed, um, it didn't have any remnant forest. And, and um, so this was grassland just for years before this picture was taken. And the other farms had mostly um, forests that look more like this. We also um, collected the species for each tree we collected. So we, we collected 40 trees for each transect, but with this we cannot estimate uh, species richness. I mean, most of the, the farms had 35 or more species, but we were lucky, as I said before, that we could share information with um, the Sinchi Institute, a local institute, that they visited six of our farms and they, they did 50 by 50 meter um, plots and they co they collected and identified every single tree there and they found up to 166 species, which is really diverse. So overall, our data show that the plant communities of traditional pasture and silvopastures are different and we find more rare species in silvopastures. Very, very good to hear that silvopastures do not make the na native pasture plants disappear, the native ones, because even the Warki area has been reported to have a lot of patic, poten uh, uh, patic activities which stops other plants from germinating. We've seen that um, the, the native most of the plants that grow in the, in the traditional pasture, they also grow in the field pasture. And most important for the local um, plant diversity, um, if, even though we measured very small and fragmented forests, they still maintained um, a very high plant diversity. So in conclusion, we would say that silvopastoral systems can help conserve na native plant diversity, but the biggest impact is protecting the forest because of that's got more diversity. And civil pastoral systems can help this, and they also don't have a negative impact on the pasture species. And as other members of the Biosmart team will explain in other talks, um, civil pastoral systems can also benefit farmers, and that's how farmers in our project have perceived it for um, the, the production productivity and also for the farm. So SPS can help conserve the forest while at the same time not um, compromising the livelihood of farmers. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Ignacio Sepulveda. I'm a researcher from Chile. I'm currently working on the Biosmart uh, project, and also I'm part of SRUC in Scotland. So the name of my presentation today is called Civil Pastoral Systems Adoption by Farmers in Caquetá, Analysis of Land Suitability. So just to start a brief introduction to set the background of my research. Okay, just a brief introduction. So uh, in the last 20 years, Colombia lost more than 4.6 million hectares of forest. Over the last 20 years, Caquetá, a department in the Colombian Amazon, has, lo has lost more than 680,000 hectares of forest, representing 43% of the national forest loss. This is mostly due to the expansion of the agricultural frontier. Also, the Colombian government is committed to the reduction of emissions, uh, trying to reach above to net zero carbon in the near future. And finally, agroforestry agro practices such as silvo pastoral systems, in which trees are managed and combined with livestock, have been promoted as an alternative to conventional cattle farming systems in Colombia. So the main objective of my research is to understand the potential impact of agroforestry expansion within a typical Amazonian department in Colombia, in this case, Caquetá, using land suitability as the main criterion of analysis. So of course, this is a really complex issue, but uh, the point of view of this research is based on land suitability. 
So the first part of my presentation uh, is about the change in the land use in Calita over time, especially over the last 20 years. So in the map above, you can see uh, Colombia. The blue line is the Amazon frontier, and in yellow is the Caqueta borders. So this is a map I created using data from the Global Forest Watch, uh, updated just a few months ago with uh, data from 2020. and uh, has three layers. So the first one from green to white is the forest cover by the year 2000. Then you have another uh, layer uh, representing the change from forest to no forest or deforestation, right? In yellow, from the first uh, 10 years on, until 2010. And then you have the third layer in red showing the deforestation pattern in the last 20 years until uh, last year. So you can see clearly that deforestation is moving from the central region in Caquetá um, to the uh, deep into the Amazon. So what happens if we make a zoom into this? So here you can see clearly hundreds of hundreds of hectares uh, or areas um, uh, uh, of land deforested in Caquetá, especially following the main river paths in the region. And you can see that in the last 10 years, it's expanding further and further into the Amazon. But not only the forestation in Caquetá is moving to that direction, it's also moving into the Andes region, not in the same uh, amount or in the same intensity, but it's also uh, affecting that, that area or that region too. And finally, deep into the Amazon, really far away from the main farming activities or agricultural activities, you can see hundreds of small deforestation patches here and here and here. It's really full of it uh, within the national park and protected areas in Caquetá. This is mostly due to illegal activities related also with some agricultural practices, but also oil and uh, mining exploration. So uh, that's the uh, uh, main view of the deforestation status in Caquetá. Um, why is that important to analyze the deforestation pattern? Because according to um, this research from Mora and Pierce from 2018, uh, around 70% of the uh, uh, land uh, use change in Caquetá uh, is related with agricultural practices. So at the end, most of the deforestation you can see here is being moving forward into the Amazon uh, by expanding the agricultural frontier. Let's move to the second part of my research. Uh, so the second part was to build a parameter that uh, allowed me to um, measure the potential in Caquetá to implement agroforestry practices. And the, this was called obviously agroforestry suitability parameter. So this parameter was built using several variables from different sources as soil quality from the harmonized world soil database, temperature and rainfall from world climb, aridity and terrain slope. And then was all extracted by the veredas. The veredas is the minimal uh, division in rural areas in Caquetá. And that allowed me to uh, use different uh, data from different sources with different pixel size and resolution into uh, the map as just one uh, unit. And in other hand, I used the FAUR uh, classification of land um, suitability uh, and then merge it together with my parameter to make more sense of it. And finally, I get this map here. So here you can see different colors and and scale from one to 10. So in, in the colors uh, around red and orange that are represented in the Andes region of Caquetá, uh, that means that that uh, region of the department is not really suitable to develop agroforestry practices. And that really makes sense because the Andes region, of course, the terrain uh, is more steppy, the, the climate is different, uh, you have more altitude, and other variables of soil quality too. But 
is really clearly, and you, you can see here that most of the area in Caquetá has these green and blue colors, meaning that the um, agroforestry potential uh, in most of the department is really, really high. And also you can see some pictures uh, to, to, give, to give it more context to, to the map. So this is uh, like the typical thin cow farm in, in, in Caquetá. And I'm saying that in this kind of landscape, you can develop agroforestry practices or have a high potential at least to develop it. And in the other hand, you have the national parks and protected areas. This is an, in, in the Southwest area of Caquetá, the Serrania de Chiquibiquete. And as you can see, uh, uh, and, and also, we are, we are not saying to develop agroforestry uh, or any kind of agricultural practices in these protected areas, but just from a, a soil quality perspective, it is also not optimal. And finally, what happened when you merge uh, the two analyses together? So, in one hand, you have the deforestation pattern and the forest cover over the last years. And all, in the other hand, you have the agroforestry potential. And you end with something like this. So this is a map that merge both variables. So what is really important here, uh, and, 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 and this is the most important part, I think, of this research at the moment. So what, what you're seeing here in this color here, so it's like a green, a, a, a light blue or, 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 or greenish, right? It's like the most deforested areas, so the areas with less forest cover in, in this column here, so the less forest covered areas have at the same time a high potential to develop agroforestry practices here and here. This here, these uh, veredas here also have a high potential to develop agroforestry, but uh, at the same time, the forest cover is not that low this is still uh, like in, in, in the middle. It's not optimal, but it's not that low. That's why you have those colors there. Uh, but at the same time, in all the deforested areas, like highly deforested here or mildly deforested here, you have a high potential to develop agroforestry practices. Again, from a uh, soil quality or land use perspective. Um, but then again, uh, we, we did a prediction for the next 10 years if uh, the current trend continues into the future. So if farmers or politicians don't adopt this kind of more sustainable practices. So here you can see a plot of the linear regression that we use to estimate the loss of forests in the next 10 years. But it's more useful to see this graphically. So here, you have um, a map of forest cover, so red areas, uh, low forest cover, green areas, high forest cover. This is for the year 2000. So see what happened uh, in the next 20 years. So this is like the current state of Caquetá. A lot of red and orange areas in the central portion of the department, but also expanding the yellow areas into the Amazon. So what's going to happen in the next 10 years, according to our prediction? So you can see that uh, now you can see more red or orange uh, veredas into the Amazon. But also in the central region, uh, you can see that is, uh, the deforestation is still affecting those already highly deforested areas. So of course, it's not a really good prediction from the environmental uh, uh, point of view. So um, our prediction between uh, 2021 and 2030 is estimated to be uh, around 12,000 kilometers square, of which uh, around 7,000 kilometers square of forests are predicted to be changed for pasture, releasing a really massive amount of carbon in that period, reaching over uh, 466 megatons of CO2 equivalent. And finally, our conclusion from my research. So first of all, most of the land in Caquetá, outside the Andes, outside the national parks and protected area, 
have a really high su suitability to adopt agroforestry practices. Second, agroforestry practices, again, including silvopastoral systems, you can see in the picture there, are a good alternative to reverse deforestation in the Colombian Amazon. And finally, deforestation predicted over the next 10 years in Caquetá could prevent the whole Colombian plan to reach net zero carbon. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Maria Paula Escobar and in this presentation I'm going to draw from work that I have carried out together with Dr. Adriana Suarez de Lucci, who works with me as a postdoc. I would like to start by saying that my intention here is to be deliberately critical and provocative. In my many years of working with policymakers, NGOs and biophysical as opposed to social scientists, I have seen how the role and contribution of social science is very often misunderstood. Today, I want to unpick that misunderstanding and point out some of its impl implications. Let me start by speaking about this how this misunderstanding works in practice and refer to the notion of sustainability. Sustainability is actually a very old concept to name the concern for the environmental degradation caused by human activities, the need for those activities to be carried out in a way that allows for their continuity of yield, and more recently, the concern for the rights of future generations to equally benefit from the natural environment. The point I want to make is that as our pursuit of sustainability made it clear that ensuring it is about managing the ways in which people relate to the natural environment, social scientists were brought into the picture so that just as in the same way in which biophysical scientists get plants, animals, microbes, cells and elements to behave in a certain way, the social scientists could do the trick of getting people to behave in the way in which we would like them to. There are two problems with this, and that is at the crux of the misunderstanding. First, that environmental challenges, such as deforestation, are understood as essentially biophysical problems, when in fact they are essentially social and political problems. Likewise, their solutions are understood as fundamentally technical, and this leads to the second problem, which is that technical approaches think of social science as an add-on, when in fact these challenges require social and political solutions in collaboration with biophysical science and technical expertise. In Biosmart, social science is not merely a contribution, but the organizing principle of how we think about deforestation and the adoption of silvopasture as a farming system. This means that when we ask about the sustainability of silvopastoral systems, we not only ask whether they make livestock farming compatible with forest and biodiversity conservation. Our fundamental question is how to make silvopastoral initiatives more effective, more adoptable, so that, the, that they have spatial and temporal continuity. Now, when we first started to explore this issue of the effectiveness in the uptake and implementation of silvopastoral and more broadly agri-environmental projects in Caquetá, one of the six Amazonian departments of Colombia, we spoke to, to, to project, project implementers and found that they tend to locate the problem in farmers. One implementer said, It seems farmers are disinclined to adopt silvopastoral systems because they change the farm's landscape in a way that clashes with farmers' ideas about how a farm should look like. Someone else said, What we need is to change the farmer's chip. And this was reiterated by others. We want to work with farmers who have the conservation chip, said a third implementer. Some meant by chip, farmers presumed idea that in order to increase productivity, they have to fell the forest. But what others expressed with this term was their perception of farmers as essentially lazy. The problem is people are lazy and don't want to work. Farmers are lazy and want you to give them everything. They have a culture of assistentialism, said a third implementer. This seemed like a very top-down explanation of the problem, and we decided to use something else instead to explore the problem from the bottom up. So we used institutional ethnography, a methodology from feminist sociology, 
that follows lived experiences, for example, obtaining an aqueduct concession or, in our case, participating or not in agri-environmental projects. It follows people from the bottom up as they navigate organizations, institutions, systems and processes. Now, by institutions, we don't necessarily mean discrete corporations or businesses, but sets of connections that start from the local and can extend well into the transnational. These systems or institutions are connected by processes and discourses. It is by tracing them that IE uncovers ruling relations that distribute power to the detriment of some and the benefit of others. So, for example, in the figure I have put here, the author traces the work of children librarians and how it is shaped by local and national organizations, policies and discourses. We carried out interviews and focus groups, analysed texts and documents and created a map of agri-environmental projects. The first thing we identified, and this is related to that misunderstanding I described earlier, is that these projects and initiatives, with their predominantly technical approach and diagnostic of the problem, fail to recognise the complexity and diversity of the realities where they land. So, while project implementers and funders are aware that there are small, medium and big farms, poorer and wealthier farmers, they fail to understand that and recognise that farmers' practices and decisions are intricately related to wider histories of colonisation, agricultural practices, economic development models, power relationships and imbalances, competing geopolitical and economic interests, cycles of violence, free trade agreements and discourses around climate change and deforestation, for example. One implication of this failure is that projects are designed with a one-size-fits-all and top-down approach that, furthermore, leaves no room for farmers' agency, autonomy and meaningful participation. A third implication of this bracketing out of complexity and diversity is that projects implementation can end up working with, perpetuating and or exacerbating inequalities. One reiterative complaint was that projects tend to favour farmers who are wealthier or better connected to local and regional elites. Now this is very interesting and it's one of the beauties of using IE. Because as you trace these connections, starting with the farmers, what you realise is that project implementation, design and funding has become an economy in itself, a complex web through which money and power circulate and of which us, academics, are also a part of. On the top left-hand corner, you will see that we have put ourselves at the University of Bristol with the UK government and the research councils. All of the actors along these complex waves of connections are waiting for the project, and just as part of the work as academics is to compete for funding for research projects, all the other actors do so too. This is what I have called the project thesis. This has many implications, but I want to note one in particular, and it's how this is transforming farmers' work and thereby their identity. Because aside from knowing how to milk cows, use fertilizers, pesticides and veterinary medicines, Farmers have also had to learn how to find out about projects, decide which ones are the good ones, sign up for them and who to be friends with in order to maximise their chances. And insofar as the projectitis exacerbates all sorts of inequalities, one can also speak of a quality political economy of project implementation. Another implication of the project it is, is that projects become an end in themselves and when this happens, their original goal can get very lost along the way and lead to shocking paradoxes. The farmer with the biggest forest, the smallest herd and very much clued into what the implementers called the conservation chip is the only of the farmers that we spoke to that despite all his efforts has never succeeded in signing up to projects. To participate, you need to be a producer, but looking after the forest does not count as work. So in other words, he is invisible to the projectitis. So just to summarise, in the bigger picture, what this means it does, is that it is worth shifting the focus from the individual to the workings of society. And in terms of our own project, what this means is that diversity and complexity cannot be bracketed out because this leads to very bad blind spots. So what to do about this? 
Well, I would suggest that first we need to think again about what needs to change. We also need to think again about our role as academics. And we also need to think again about what interdisciplinarity means and how to do it in practice. Thank you very much. Everyone, thanks for listening and thanks for giving the talks, guys. They're really interesting. Um, so we actually don't have too much time left in the session, um, but we have got a question from Jill Thompson, um, who asks, how extensive is silver pasture being used in Colombia? And is there a government policy to support it in other areas or is it just small projects? So this isn't directed to anyone in particular. Um, so I don't know who would be best to answer this, if it would be the land use guy or the native Colombian. Um, either, either of you want to jump in? Um, I'll risk something as a native Colombian. Um, I am not aware of a specific policy to implement and support silvopastoral systems, but I am aware that the biggest uh, association of cattle uh, farmers, both for dairy and for meat, the FEGAN, Federación Nacional de Ganaderos, has been supporting um, silvopastoral as an alternative uh, in different regions. And there is also an organization called Aso Pastoril based in another area of the country who has been supporting and implementing um, a few uh, projects and have put them as an observatory. So they're following them longitudinally to see, to understand differences between regions. Um, and there is also quite a lot of research. So I don't know if it's official, but there is definitely an interest. Okay, great. Um, and just something I've been thinking of as working as part of this Biosmart um, project is, um, Ignacio, you've shown that there's just so much land in Kakata that is suitable for silver pasture. And while there is evidence that it is a kind of more sustainable way of intensifying land use, how do we go about using it as a tool to tackle deforestation, to kind of not that we can prevent this expansion and the use of silver pasture, but do you have any thoughts? Or it's a pretty complicated <laughs> question. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Lois. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I think that's the main objective at the end. Uh, with the data I provide, uh, we are showing that most of Kakata has it's really high potential to develop this more sustainable project. But we have to put more uh, attention uh, in the areas that are already highly deforested and how to sequestrate more carbon, for example, with that point of view, but also how to restore nature and how to bring uh, the forest back into, into the farms. I think th there's a really high potential to do it um, as the data uh, shows, so yeah. Okay, thanks. So there is um, a question addressed to Maria Paula. It says from Sarah Sherburn. And it says, amazing presentation, Maria Paula. I would love to hear your thoughts on how to prevent projects becoming a goal on it, in of themselves. How can you expand planning beyond the scope of the individual project? Thank you. Um, I would say that that is one of those million dollar questions because I am aware that funders are aware of these pitfalls and complications and it is very difficult. Um, there are so many interests coming from so many different places in implementing these projects. I would say um, that there is, again, not a silver bullet for this. There is no just one way of solving. Um, but if we are aware of the problem, I think that at least, I mean, I think I would only think from a, as an academic point of view, we need to be aware that this is happening and make sure that we uh, don't contribute to that or that uh, our contribution is, is aware of this. Um, it's, it's very complicated because then funders are always so far apart and funding comes from so many different sources um, that policy at a distance is very difficult. I don't know that I really can say anything else. <laughs> So um, another question for Ignacio. Um, 
so do you do you think from your data and the data available do you think that um that the expansion of the agricultural frontier to the deep forest in Kakita would that be would do you think that silvesters could help reduce that at uh, the, the speed of the advance? Thank you, Christina. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, actually, the numbers show that if the same trends continue in the next 10 years, deforestation is going to expand way further into the Amazon and already in the areas that are, uh, have a really low forest cover at the moment. So, um, like if we, if the people there don't do nothing in the next 10 years, the, the scenario is really, is really awful. So I think not just silvopastoral, but also other types of agroforestry or more sustainable way of, of farming um, are a suitable way uh, to stop in some kind of deforestation or, or, or to stop the expanding of the, of deforestation. As, uh, as you know, um, uh, the productivity that a farm can have using these, these systems is also really high. So they can um, change the way they are, they, they are, uh, you know, or, or, or change the, um, the actual systems they are using right now that are is really ex uh, uh, extensive uh, pastures and, 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 and expanding deforestation for these more suitable ways. I think, I think it's possible. But as Maria also said, uh, bring all these projects to, to realities is it, really complex. Um, Maria, if you have more points to add, you can just straight up um, say them if you wish, or you can add it later on the Huba platform. But yeah. Oh, that you. You're muted, Maria. You're muted, Maria. Muted, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted maybe to add a little bit to my answer there to say that perhaps the key thing to do is to design projects from the bottom up. So rather than projects being designed elsewhere uh, and being kind of dropped in the region, you need to really get the researchers or the implementers in the region, get the farmers um, and, and allow them to participate meaningfully in the design um, and the objectives of, of the projects. Um, but then you need to think about different indicators for project success. It's a tricky problem. Okay, um, we don't have any other questions coming through for the time being, but feel free to write to us directly or post questions on Hoover later on, if you can think of anything. Um, so yeah. Yes, um, in the Hoover uh, portal below our talk, there's a questions um, and answers panel. So, and also don't hesitate to contact us if you want in Twitter, it's at Biosmart um, Amazon or our website that's um, biosmartamazonia.org. And yeah, so thank you very much for all the attendees and the questions. And was there another question? Um, yeah, I think we have another question yeah. from, from Jill. Uh, yeah. What are future plans for further work along the Biosmart lines? Well, depending on that complicated funding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I know personally for me, like. Um, the Biosmart project is ongoing and I have data coming in all the time. So I'm coming up with more and more questions to do with the invertebrates. Um, so far, I've kind of looked at like if there are differences in invertebrate communities, but next I need to see like how they're different and what makes them important. So it does seem that silver pasture, it can be an intermediate um, habitat between forest and traditional pasture, but I need to kind of figure out what that means and what that can mean for farmers as well, which is complicated. Yes, and so we I have more data was collected this year um, with the partners uh, in Lakita, and we'll have 
plenty more results coming um, than we've shown today, including also carbon sequestration and, and other things. And we're going to have as well, as Maria said, um, the conclusions of the project are going to be, um, a draft of them are going to be um, put to the farmers and the farmers will have their say and his, their views will be included in the final um, conclusions that we have as, as a project. Yes, we are in the run up to the end of the project. So now we're focusing on producing our impact uh, documents and materials. We have a podcast, we have a video, we have a leaflet. We're trying to go and see them. Oh, there's one minute left. So I'm going to shut up. Watch this space. But also, not too early to plug next year's conference, we will have a symposium hopefully there too, which should have more results from the Biosmart project. But yeah, but thank you everyone for joining us and for your questions at the end. Yeah, there was one more uh, question. I don't know if you have enough time, but... Um, we might answer that on Hoover yeah, so that we can properly line. answer yeah. it. Yes, sorry, Sarah. We'll, we'll get like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Have a great Thank conference. You.